Hello and welcome to the Discover Virginia Beach podcast. I'm your host, Joseph Trahan, your tour guide to the Virginia Beach area. If this is your first time listening, I am so glad you found this show. Each week, I publish a new interview with locals ranging from musicians, government officials, CEOs, artists, and much more. And my aim is simple. It's to help you discover, define, and then go out and do exactly what you're looking for during your next vacation, relocation, or outing to the Virginia Beach area. And if you're looking to join in on the conversation, take part in monthly giveaways, and get your hands on my custom event calendars, head on over to Facebook and send me a friend request. That's Joseph Trahan. And check out my Facebook group of nearly 50,000 fans of the Virginia Beach area. Don't worry about writing anything down. The links for each episode along with the Facebook groups will be in the description below and also in the show notes. All right, here's the show. Hello, and welcome back to the Discover Virginia Beach podcast, where we set out to discover, define, and do exactly what the Virginia Beach area has to offer for both locals and tourists alike. Today, I am joined by the Virginia Hype Girl, uh, or what most people call her is just a Crystal. (laughs) Crystal, we're super excited to uh, have you on the podcast today. Welcome. Thank you. Nice to be here. I appreciate you inviting me. Wonderful. Well, Crystal Kitchen, I'd love to give you the full uh, 360 view here for your bio. So she, uh, Crystal actually graduated with an MBA from Liberty University and is currently lived in Smithfield, Virginia, uh, with 17 years of hands-on experience uh, within the marketing field, and then transitioned to be a social media marketing uh, manager and basically owner during the pandemic uh, with in-person events were not a thing. <laughs> and she also created a blog, The Virginia Hype Girl, and partnered with uh, GHJ Photography to create Virginia yes. Foodie Photography. What what a resume. Um, Crystal, I, I'd love to know from you, is there any direction you'd like to start off with um, looking at your accolades? I, I'd love to know a little bit more about what got you started uh, in, in general. Would that be a fair place to start? Sure. Yeah, let's dive in. So growing up, my dad was in business for himself. He actually went in business when he was 15 and a half years old. I know that's just wow. Uh, He started a grocery store business. And by the time he retired, 55 years later, he had multiple gas stations and that same grocery store, just a little bigger. So I grew up getting to see firsthand that entrepreneur attitude, what it's like to be a small business owner, really had a lot of appreciation for it. And when I was working on my undergrad, though, I didn't want to go into the grocery store business. It just it wasn't for me. And I thought I might have wanted to go to law school. So my undergrad was all in criminology, sociology and psych. But I just loved business. And I ended up doing a gig in 2007 with Burger King for the Jonas Brothers concert down in Virginia Beach. Oh, wow. Just as something to make money as a college student, you know, and I loved it. I was absolutely obsessed. And I said, I love this event marketing. I love the hands-on marketing. I want to learn more. So I ended up changing and getting an MBA with a concentration in marketing instead. So a total, total direction change there. <laughs> yeah, no, no kidding. But that's kind of like how life happens, right? We have an idea yes. about how our journey is going to be. And then something changes that we didn't plan for. And it just ends up being maybe a little bit different than we expected. Yes. Now, Crystal, I understand um, you you grew up here in the Virginia Beach area. Is that correct? Yes. So I'm a Virginia native. I actually grew up in a town called Ivor. It's a one stoplight town off of 460. It's between Richmond and Virginia Beach. Grew up going to Virginia Beach a lot as a young person. And then, of course, going to Virginia Wesleyan University. Anytime I could go to the oceanfront and go to the beach, I was there. (laughs) I, I love that. And and that's so cool for our listeners who may not be familiar with the area. Ivor is is part of the Hampton Roads, the 757 Collective. Um, yes. We commonly refer to here as just Virginia Beach area. Crystal, I'm curious for you, after going to school, growing up here, what exactly got you to stick around and build your adult life and your business here in this area? 
So growing up, I was fascinated with Smithfield. I love things that are historical and Smithfield always had that charm for me. And so my dream when I was growing up was to end up moving to Smithfield. I wanted a house on the water and it ended up happening for me after I got out of grad school and I just wanted to stay put. So it was part of my actual dream. I know some people's dream is go to the big city, but that wasn't mine. So <laughs> I I totally get that. And especially, you know, with your career in the limelight, which we'll talk about a little bit later, the big city is is traditional of a lot of people who feel like bigger city equals better life. Um, yeah. I'd love to kind of capture a moment with you. I know you mentioned prior to our interview that you had uh, great memories growing up with your dad cooking in the kitchen. Is there any um, maybe memories or um just times in that season that stand out to you as being more simpler and although smaller, still meaningful to you? So like I said, Ivor is literally a one stoplight town, very tiny. And Diddy had the only grocery store when I was growing up that was within miles. So he used to, at Christmas and Thanksgiving, cook all these felt hams. And from Southampton County, it is ham county. And I can remember growing up him showing me, you know, how to soak the ham, how to change the water on the ham, put the hams in the cooker. And he would be cooking up all these delicious hams. And I, I just became fascinated with cooking and watching him. He used to cook uh, deli sandwiches in the business out of these hams. He would make sandwiches, too. And, you know, local people, they just love that. He roasted peanuts in the store. Uh, chocolate covered. He had all kinds of little candies and it it just had that, you know, people today go to like a Cracker Barrel and they see a country store. No, this was more than that. This was like what you see basically like on a Hallmark movie. And that's how I grew up. And that's where that fascination for food, it definitely came from. I, I love that. And, and just that small town feel really translated into your time in the community. I, I'd love to specifically uh, talk about this core theme throughout your journey, which uh, started, I believe, you know, at a young age and and serving with your family, and also kind of translated to the uh, your college years at Wallace W. White Community Service. Uh, you actually had a scholarship there for four years, uh, as well as writing a and publishing a research paper in college, just about this idea of volunteer functions inventory VFI scale is is what they call it them college folks. <laughs> what about volunteering in general and giving back to others really resonated with you? And um, can you tell us more about like what helped you pick that career? Like what, what led you to that, um, you know, volunteering in that sector? So growing up, um, my dad constantly talked about what it was like for them growing up. He had six brothers and sisters. They grew up. My, my father is older. He's, been gone now for 10 years but if he was alive he'd be almost 90 so he was from that really you know hard working older generation and he just believed that people needed to give back even if you didn't have a lot you could invest your hands and you could give somebody your time and he just always pushed that in myself and also in my half brother when we were growing up you know you need to give back to people and he used to talk about when he was growing up and they were underprivileged to a certain extent. They didn't have, you know, all the fancy things, but he talked about a neighbor of theirs having a pony and, you know, they were wealthy and they had a pony, but they used to let all the kids in the neighborhood come over and ride that pony, pet that pony, you know, and I just, I don't know, growing up, he really pushed that in me. And so as I got older, I wanted to find more ways to get involved and, and volunteerism just became like really, really top of my list. That is such a really cool story, especially considering like, you know, Ivor itself, you know, and Franklin, like people have ponies, right? It's not necessarily <laughs> something you see in Norfolk necessarily, or in the Virginia Beach area, unless you're, you know, at a show or a rodeo. Right. So that's a really cool, um, I believe, facet of, of that uh, way of life that I think, you know, in a lot of ways has been forgotten in that simple uh, act of just giving to others. Uh, it's very commendable. Um Crystal, uh, before we get into uh, your your educational journey, which I know it didn't stop there, I definitely want to talk about your MBA. Um, however, I, I would like to highlight your time when you represented uh, Virginia as Miss America in 2006, and then when you went on to the next year to the National America Miss and Miss Beauty International. Um, 
you know, you made a variety of appearances, uh, both at the state and the local level. I'd love to hear from you. Are there any, um, you know, any specific memories that stand out to you uh, during that time that helped kind of form the way in which um, you conduct your business and the way you live your life now? So I at first did not want to get involved in pageantry in any way. I have never been a super girly girl, if that's what you want to call it. And my dad really pushed me. He said, you know, you want to be able to get your platform out to people. And to be able to get that platform out there, you've got to get in front of people. And the best way I can tell you to get in front of people, I think, as a woman, is for you to get into pageantry. And that might have been some of that old school way, but, you sure. know, he he got me involved in it. So I, I went into National American Miss, I participated in a pageant, never had any coaching, had no idea what I was doing. These other girls, to a certain extent, were kind of terrifying because they had their routines down. I didn't know what I was going to do. I ended up doing some humorous prose for my talent. But where I ended up shining was in the interview. A lot of these people, unfortunately, hadn't done a lot of stuff. They might have um, participated in singing in their church or they might have participated in, you know, something like that. But they hadn't done like the hands on work. And I really think that that's how I end up being National American Miss Virginia. And then just going from there and. That's the only thing I could say about it. You blame my dad again. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Our our parents definitely have a big influence on us. Uh, whether we realize it in childhood or adulthood, it definitely plays a part in how we live our lives. Um, well, I, I commend you for that, Crystal. And that's a very um, interesting part of your journey. And I would love to kind of uh, highlight this next part too, because it's really amazing. And I know you have the blog and other podcast interviews you've done. So I definitely want to uh, cover some new territory if that's all right with you. Um, would you mind sharing us uh, when this first started for you as far as, uh, you know, getting into the business world? What was, um, was business just firsthand with you growing up at the, at the grocery store uh, and, and you were fascinated with it? Or did you really have to like go to school and then like realize it was more your cup of tea? So when I was growing up, they used to have these people that would come around to represent brands. For instance, Morton Salt had a girl that would come around with a little umbrella and she would do a little stand up thing in the business to push Morton Salt. And I thought, wow, this is really interesting. This is like a live commercial in the middle of our grocery store. And this is the coolest. And I was probably six or seven years old. And I asked my dad about it. And he really didn't push me into that kind of a career. Um, I can't say he was against it, but he was just like, you, you need to have an education and you need to you know, focus on business if that's what you want to do. But then the older I got, I said, I'm really into more the legal type thing. And I think I want to go be a lawyer. So you know, he just kind of let me do whatever, was very supportive of it. But I think he was extremely happy when I made that turnaround and told him, hey, dad, I'm not going to apply law school. I'm actually going to apply, you know, to go get my master's in business administration. I could see that that happy stance. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, you know, regardless of our career path for school, I mean, that definitely can add an element of uh, understanding that you know, most people might not traditionally get just, you know, bumping shoulders with other folks. I'm curious for you, have, was there any um, specific lessons or opportunities that came about once you did obtain your MBA and start figuring out um, the more critical business side of how you wanted to operate and, and run your business? When I was working on the MBA at Liberty, I did some in-person classes and some online classes. At the time, my dad had cancer. He had shut down his business and technically retired at 55 years. So it was kind of a juggle between personal life and getting that master's degree. So at first, I wasn't able to really immerse myself, if that makes sense, in my classes. I mean, I was doing them. I was making fantastic grades. But then when I really got to go on campus and start talking with professors face to face, you know, this is before the pandemic when not everyone was doing these Zoom calls and there wasn't that face to face there. So you needed to go and like be in person with someone. Mm -hmm. And I would say that once I got on campus at Liberty and started really connecting with people that, you know, things just really started to fall into place. Maybe not so much with the experiential marketing because 
it was a relatively new field. Like people weren't as much into talking about the things that you could do with hands-on or face-to-face marketing. People started thinking out of the box, I would say probably more leading up into the pandemic. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the pandemic definitely reshaped the landscape of the way we view marketing in general and just not really a digital playbook uh, necessarily in most marketing aspects. Um, also, sh- shout out to F- Go Flames. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, I would love to feature uh, and, and talk about your website and your blog next, especially as um, the pandemic came about uh, and we did have to switch to more of a digital presence. Uh, considering the the wealth of content information it has to, uh, you know, general readers and travelers alike, you know, your your website covers uh, and blogs cover just quite a, a span of, of information, which is why we wanted to have you on the show, The, the Virginia Hype Girl. Uh, can you tell us more about the blog and how it got started and what inspiration kind of led you down to all these different avenues of content creation? So prior to the pandemic, I was full on experiential marketing, hands-on. I had worked with some pretty big brands, uh, General Motors, Chevrolet, Ford Motor Company, Serta, uh, all kinds of, you know, really, really nice brands. But the thing is, is during the pandemic, when it started, obviously those in-person events, they all got canceled, no more fairs, no more festivals, all the hands-on stuff gone. So who I really saw struggling was not those big companies because they already had, you know, the money for advertising, like on the TV. These smaller businesses did not. So I started talking to some of the businesses around me locally saying, hey, have you ever thought about, you know, hyping up your social media? Because that's where you can really connect with people right now. People are at home. They're on their phones. Um, You know, have you ever thought about doing that? So that's where the idea came from. And surprisingly, there were some people that they were they were willing to brave this out. There was a a hotel that invited me to come out. I wore my mask. I did, um, you know, a whole little blog about their hotel. I put it on YouTube, like 7000 views. I thought, wow, this is pretty decent. I I think I might have something with this. And then I I just kept playing around with it and, you know, trying to network with a lot of people that I had made friends with um, over the years, people I went to college with. Hey, do you know anybody that might be interested in this? And it just went from there. And then I thought, I'm hyping these businesses. So I I need a cool name, not just Crystal. So (laughs) I started to call myself the Virginia Hype Girl. And it, it just went from there. I love that story, especially, um, you know, looking back to your roots of like giving back to people and volunteering, just you being able to having been with all these big name brands, recognizing that, hey, the little guy, the small business, uh, maybe the mom with kids who's trying to get started on her own business needs a voice and a spotlight uh, and strategically maneuvering yourself in a way to, you know, show up in a way that, you know, during COVID didn't really have a a blueprint for, I mean, how do you reach people on your phones? Like you go on YouTube, you utilize and leverage social media. Um, for, for you, Crystal, when did photography begin to play a more prominent role? Was it, was it pre COVID? Uh, did that come about when you started partnering with small businesses? Uh, can you give it highlight when that, when that process started for you in your timeline? Sure. So basically with working with businesses on social media, I was trying to help them put their content online. And what I found out was a lot of these small businesses, they didn't have content or either the content they had didn't look very professional. So I had messed around a little bit with photography, but I had a friend that I had worked with for years, mainly when I was doing modeling with pageantry and he was running GHJ photography in Virginia Beach. And I, I called him up. I said, hey, Glenn, you know, I'm doing this stuff with social media right now. And so many of these businesses, they don't have great content. In fact, their stuff looks really bad. (laughs) So maybe if we got together, you know, we could help these businesses by giving them actual, you know, decent and credible content. And he thought it was a pretty good idea because he had just retired and he was kind of getting out of, you know, the photography in Virginia Beach because of the pandemic. There there weren't a lot of jobs and in-person, you know, events for photography. So it ended up being just a great thing for both of us. I, that's so cool. And and I appreciate you sharing that because I wasn't sure if like uh, that was part of your branding or if that was an individual you brought on to say, hey, 
come help me make great things happen. So I really appreciate that. And then shout out to it. I, I butchered the name at the beginning, but GHJ Photography is your partner that you work with on uh, the photography side of things, correct? Yes. And he actually, he closed his portrait photography business, which was JHJ. And okay. then he and I together started Virginia Foodie Photography. So that's been going on for the last three years during the pandemic. And the name and the whole you know idea of it makes more sense for businesses. Obviously, they're not into portrait photography. They, they want photos of their products and food and <laughs> things that pertain to them. Absolutely. And and part of your content, one of the main spheres that you have is the food and the dishes themselves that you feature. Uh, it seems like food content vlogging and reviews have been around for a long time, you know, from the early days of, you know, Amber Lagasse shouting bam on the television mm -hmm. uh, to the infamous man eats food and dinners, divers and drives, however you say it. <laughs> when it comes to food and in your food journey, what helps you distinguish your voice and branding uh, throughout all the noise and voices around, you know, trying out new food? For me, I'm looking to partner with people that are smaller businesses. And it's fun to do some of the larger brands and to interact with them. But I just love working with people that have heart and you can literally taste the heart in the food. And then when I capture that, or if Glenn captures that, and then I write about it, I feel like other people are going to, you know, just embrace that mom and pop. And that's what I love about it. I think that's what's different with me. You know, I'm, I'm not trying to, to influence people. I, to a certain extent, I don't really like the word influencer. I'm social media marketing. Yes, I do have an account that has quite a few followers, but to me, it's about the brand. It's about the business I'm working with. And I would rather someone look at that content and come to that business than for them to be concerned with me and what I'm eating personally as a person. It, it's all about the brand. Right. Cause you just, you're just talking about the food that you've enjoyed and yes. yeah, there may be a partnership or two uh, that exists, but it exists because you enjoy the product, the service or experience involved. Um, I've really enjoyed following your Instagram. And of course, for uh, all of our listeners here, we'll definitely have that in the link in the description below that way you can check out uh, the Virginia Hype Girl, uh, the foodie page that you have, and of course, all the fun uh, adventures you're going on. Um, with that said, I mean, obviously community plays a big part in the way we which uh, in which we conduct our businesses. I'm, I'm curious for you, um, have there been any local community uh, events, uh, people or or projects of yours that you've worked on that have really shaped the way in which you do uh, your business? say that living in Smithfield um, really impacts me a lot. I don't work for them specifically or on their tourism, but I love tourism and any kind of like community thing that we have going on. If I'm not working or on an event somewhere else, I try to go to our local stuff. Um, I have like a little Instagram that's the Hamtown Explorer that's just about things going on in Smithfield. I went through the little training that they do uh, basically teach you the background and history of Smithville to become a ham ambassador. And I just basically hype up our town. I, I'd be on an airplane going somewhere and, you know, small talk beside you. They say, where are you from? I say, ham town. And then that, that gets going, you know, ham town, what's that? You know, what's well, actually Smithfield, but we're the ham capital of the world. And I just want to encourage people to, you know, to come here and to visit. So I'd say that living in Smithfield probably influences me quite a bit. <laughs> I, I love that, especially, you know, calling back to your your days, you know, creating ham and learning the processes with your with your dad and, and seeing it all happen at the supermarket. I mean, you've come full circle of seeing the, you know, the life of ham, but also the life of uh, that it's, you know, been able to provide for the community uh, as well. And just the cool features to highlight in general, um, which is super inspiring. Uh, can you um, can you share an example of a time when you received feedback uh, or or the needs of the local community kind of shouted out, hey, this is what we need. Uh, and it provided, you know, a significant change or innovation uh, to the way in which you approach your business. For the most part, I feel like even now that people are a little bit scared to like approach someone, especially if they see an account has a pretty decent amount of following, they get that whole vibe of, like I said, the influencer, you know, someone's going to come out and they're just going to basically try to get something free and maybe not be there to promote the brand. It's more about them and self-promotion. So 
I feel like that sometimes it's more me letting people know that there are people out there that actually can help your brand and, you know, are not out for self-promotion. And I think that's the biggest thing that I go through with this. And I've been really blessed because I have like five different brands I work with on a monthly basis, creating user-generated content. So it's not stuff that I even have to post on my own. It's all going on their social media. And I love it when restaurants contact me and they want UGC. And the restaurants pretty much ended up being networking. You know, they saw my work on other pages. They might have seen the tag or they messaged the restaurant owner and said, hey, those pictures look really good or that reel looks really good. Who are you working with? And most people locally will be honest, you know, and they've shared it. And so that's where I've gotten a lot of, of my clients from has just been networking. Because I feel like that people, again, are just really, unfortunately, you know, unable to understand the benefit maybe of the social media marketing. Sure, absolutely. Especially when it is so new for a lot of people. Um, I, being in the real estate industry myself, you know, 2020 just kind of shook everything up in that like, yes, you can do virtual tours, you can do uh, digital signings, everything became more prominent on the digital side. Uh, it kind of expedited a lot of conversations that have been happening, you know, from 2010 to 2020 with the creation of all the social media, um, you know, networks and such. Uh, for you, Crystal, do you, how do you see your business evolving in the future, continue to, uh, you know, continue meeting the unique demands uh, or characteristics of the local community in general? I think as time goes on that people are really going to start to see the benefit of social media marketing. And I'm hoping that brands might end up kind of accepting the fact that that's where marketing probably is going to go and that yeah. it's going to be more of the individual um, you know, trying to get their content out there than maybe like these huge ad campaigns that we saw in the past. And I think that that's really good because I feel like the brand gets a lot more individualization out of it. And it's not just all blurred and we're all seeing the same thing. Yeah, that that's so true, especially as time moves on, right? They it's like, what, why don't you get it? You know, like this is this is beneficial, you know, whether that's a podcast or a short or, you know, just a fun video highlighting what you're eating, like can have just as much brand awareness, if not more, uh, you know, for a specific business. Ha has there been a campaign uh, for you, Crystal, that like really highlights your skill set that you've done recently that you don't mind sharing, uh, maybe a, with a certain brand or a campaign in general, and maybe walk us through some of the specifics about what made it fun and enjoyable for you to create? I love stuff that has to do with tourism because I feel like that if people come to Virginia, that all of us benefit from it. People have no idea how much tourism really can impact and affect us. And so I love it when I get to work with hotels and Airbnbs or just small little mom and pop places to stay at. And a couple of months ago, I did a blog for the Inn at Meander. And they're up in Northern Virginia. They're outside of Virginia's wine country. And they were probably one of the most hospitable and just family oriented type organization that I've seen. I mean, I just felt so welcome from the moment that I got there, just interacting with them. And it's like when I wrote the blog, I, I mentioned different people that I had met and saying they were the true gem of that, you know, establishment. It was the people. It wasn't, yes, it was a beautiful historical building, gorgeous setting. The food was amazing. But it was the people. And I, that just really stands out to me because unfortunately, there's some brands I work with. They're just very, you know, just just black and white. And it's just all business. And I don't mind working with those individuals. But at the same time, like I would much rather make a connection with somebody. And I yeah. made a connection there. <laughs> I love that. That that's is so amazing, and I definitely will once again shout out your blog because um, you know there's a lot of great resources and tools, especially for our audience members who may not be local. They may be visiting or planning to visit here in the Virginia area, and a lot of folks are like, "Joe, what's there to do in Virginia Beach?" I'm like, "Here's my Facebook group," but also like there are all of these other uh, things going on and happenings that quite frankly, was an inspiration for this podcast. So Crystal, we appreciate the work that you're doing. I appreciate uh, everything you're doing to highlight the area, especially those smaller towns that not many people know about. 
Yeah, we're so, not that far out here. You're a little over an hour. I mean, I used to, when I was at Virginia Wesleyan, I used to drive back and forth, go to college, come home. So it's really not a bad drive to come out to Smithfield or to even come out to Southampton County. You can go get a, a genuine Southampton County ham. <laughs> absolutely not. And especially the scenic drive too. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, I know like Suffolk has the airfield uh, and then you have the, um, just the historic homes in general. A lot of those homes yes. have been, sitting there uh, for hundreds of years, which is a really cool piece of history also. Um, so yeah, uh, Crystal, I know you got to get back to uh, the next campaign and, and make a great content. So we're going to go ahead and wrap it up with the uh, last section here, the rapid fire section. These questions are quick and fast, rapid fire. Feel free to expand with as much or as little detail as you'd like. Are you ready? I'm ready. Perfect. Uh, favorite city you have visited in Virginia so far? Probably Williamsburg. I know that's close by, but I just love it. I think it has like such a great vibe to it and it has modern things, but then the historical aspect of it, I'm in love. <laughs> Perfect. Love it. Love it. When it uh, when you think back to your Miss Virginia days, what was the the biggest perk that you had um being in that in that field and uh during that time? Definitely making the connections and meeting people. That was amazing. But honestly, probably my most memorable moment was when my dad got to come up on stage and give me my flowers when I was crowned. <laughs> oh, <laughs> such a sweet moment, especially when it you was. can, you know, share share in that honoring moment. Absolutely. Yes. Um, favorite restaurant or style of food to enjoy here in the area, not including ham. <laughs> Not including ham. See, you limited me. <laughs> um, I probably would say off of 460 and Wakefield, uh, there is a place everybody knows it was on Diners, Driving and Dives, the Virginia Diner. And you can get other things there. But do you have ham biscuits, though? <laughs> they have a pulled chicken sandwich that is one of my favorites. And the carrot souffle is amazing. You can either have it for a dessert or you can have it as a side and definitely get that little sweet treat in. <laughs> Love it. And we'll definitely count that because it has a whole lot of other wonderful things to offer as well. Yes. And Crystal. peanuts. <laughs> oh, and peanuts. Absolutely. Do not forget about the peanuts. <laughs> uh, Crystal, what's your favorite Virginia beach to visit? Um, where I live at in Smithfield in my subdivision, we have a beach. Unfortunately, it is private, our community, but it is our little oasis. But as far as tourists coming, you can go to Fort Boykin Beach in Smithfield and it'll give you the same views that I get over here on our community beach. It's just very quiet. You see the James River Bridge. If you go a certain way looking, you can see the docks over at Kings Mill clear day you can see the roller coasters over at wish garden so it's really cool <laughs> wow first first time i'm hearing about this can i get the name of, of the of public beach uh from me again it's uh, fort boykin and it's in smithfield and it actually is an old civil war area that you can go visit it has a lot of historical facts to it so even if you're not into going to the beach you might want to just go there and visit it Fort Boykin. Perfect. Yes. I will add that to the list here. And that brings us to our last rapid fire question. Uh, what is the, what is your favorite or most memorable volunteer project or initiative that you've been involved in so far? Probably when I was in college and I was working on my little mini thesis and I decided to do my research on the VFI, which is basically like measuring out how people are impacted to volunteer. So what makes them want to volunteer? Some people are in it because they want the notoriety. Some people are in it because they want to feel good. Some people are in it because their mom, dad, somebody made them do it. Right. So it was really interesting going around and actually interviewing people, not just my peers, but at other colleges and figuring out what motivated them. And I thought that was really cool because I think a lot of brands, a lot of businesses and volunteer projects really could benefit from that. And then it was awesome when my professor said, you know, this is so good. You should publish this. So I really appreciated that. Wonderful. Yes, absolutely. And just figuring out how people work and how to connect with them is, um, you know, it's why we're here. It's why we have these yeah. conversations and share the content we do. Uh, Crystal, with that said, I'd love to 
roll out the red carpet for you uh, and give you the floor. Any uh, special projects, events, or anything you want to promote, uh, the time is yours. Please share that now. So I would just say to anybody that has listened to your podcast and is listening to this particular episode, if you're a business or a brand and you're thinking about hiring somebody for social media marketing, do your research. There are people out there that are for you. They're for your brand. They're not for self-promotion. Don't hire people based on their following count. If you're looking for someone that's maybe influencer marketing, dive deeper, find out who they're following, find out, you know, if they're in your niche, find out if it's somebody that is supporting what you're supporting. I think it's so unfortunate to see so many brands get scammed. And they get these people that come in and they just take a free product or a free stay or whatever it is. They don't promote it very well. And unfortunately, they might buy likes or they might buy, you know, views to make the brand think that they were successful and the brand gets scammed. And that's the type of stuff that really breaks my heart. And so I just encourage, especially small businesses, do your research and maybe even reach out to other businesses and ask them, hey, have you worked with anybody? Do you know anybody that does this? And just really listen to that word of mouth and maybe not think on the, the big number scale, because that's the biggest thing I see. I love that. That's a great piece of advice too, especially uh, when you are looking to uh, you know connect with other brands and, and folks like that getting those reviews and checking online. Uh, and then of course, just checking the link in the description below so you can connect with Crystal directly. Uh, and that is uh, my biggest recommendation for you all listening uh, for our business owners. Uh, with that said, that brings us to another episode for Discover Virginia Beach Podcast. Thank you, Crystal, for uh, your time and expertise and story. Uh, and then of course, thank you all to our dedicated listeners checking us out for another episode. We hope you enjoyed it. Leave a like uh, or comment. And of course, if you're listening to the podcast, leave a review and let me know what I can do better on and would love to and invite you all to check out another episode very soon.